Let's introduce the idea of covariance. So for a single random variable x, the PMF, P of x, or if you're dealing with a continuous random variable, the PDF, f of x, provides a full description of the random variable, while the mean, e of x, and the variance, variance of x, they're just simple summaries, right? So the mean tells you the center of mass, and the variance tells you how much the random variable um, varies around that center of mass. For a pair of random variables, let's call them x and y, the joint PMF, p of x, y, or in the continuous case, the joint PDF, f of x, y, that provides a full probabilistic description of what the two random variables are doing uh, jointly. While the means, e of x and e of y, and the variances, variance of x and variance of y, those are actually only summarizing how x and y behave individually. So it, they do not capture anything about their relationship because you could calculate each of these directly from the marginals. You don't need the joint PMF or PDF. So the question is, can we summarize the relationship or dependencies between X and Y with a single number? And there are gonna be many ways we could do this, and each are gonna have pros and cons. We are going to specifically focus on the covariance, which we write as cov XY, and that's going to capture the average linear relationship between x and y. And to be a little bit more precise between the um, x and y with their means removed. We'll see that just now. So the covariance, which we write cove of x, y, of random variables x and y, that's just defined to be the average value of x minus its mean times y minus its mean. So we just take x minus its mean, y minus its mean, and then average that product. Sometimes it's easier to see what's going on and to work with this expression if we just write the covariance as e of x minus mu x times y minus mu y, and just remember that this mu x is the mean of x and this mu y is the mean of y, and that really solidifies the fact that these means are just numbers we're subtracting. We don't have to think of them as random. And what this is doing intuitively is capturing the average linear relationship between x minus its mean and y minus its mean. Um, a useful alternative formula, similar to the one we saw in the variance case, is that the covariance can be just written as e of xy minus e of x times e of y. Okay, so sometimes this is actually easier to compute. Why does it hold? Well, usually the answer is linearity of expectation. That's the case here as well. So we write the covariance. We expand out this product, so we write first, outer, inner, last, and then we finally use linearity of expectation to move the expectation onto each term, and we see that we have e of x times mu of y, mu of x times e of y, and then a constant. And since mu of x is just e of x and mu of y is just e of y, we actually notice that these last three terms are all the same, right? So we have minus, minus, plus, and that's just minus e of x times e of y. And that's what we had in the alternate formula. The intuition here is that if the covariance is positive, then x minus its mean and y minus its mean tend to have the same signs, okay? So visually what that looks like is they tend to occupy the green quadrants here, plus plus and minus minus. And in that sense, you can think that the um, linear relationship is going to have a positive slope. And if the covariance is negative, then x minus its mean and y minus its mean tend to have opposite signs. So they tend to live in these orange quadrants, minus plus and plus minus. It's important to remember that this is in a weighted average sense. So when you're taking larger values of x and y into this average, they contribute more, even if they have lower probability, because we're actually using the values of x and y. So you'll see that a line with positive slope fits better for things that live in the green quadrants, and a line with a negative slope fits better for things that like to live in the orange quadrants. And that's what we mean by the average linear relationship. So if you spend more time in the green quadrants, then a line with a positive slope might do an okay job of fitting um, the relationship, and 
Similarly, in the other orange quadrants, a negative slope might be better. So let's take some time to work out a longer example, and then we'll return to some more properties. So in this example, x given that y is equal to y is uniform between y and y plus 2. y is just uniform 0, 3. What is the covariance of x and y? All right, well, first we're going to need the means. So the mean of y is just the mean of a uniform 0, 3. It's just going to be right in the center. It's going to be 3 halves. To get the mean of x, we're going to use the law of total expectations. So we're going to write e of x as e of e of x given y. That's going to be much more convenient. So this is the law of total expectation. First, we can get the conditional mean and then the mean. So the conditional mean is just between y and y plus 2. So halfway between y and y plus 2, since it's uniform. And that's just going to be the mean of y plus 1. We know e of y. So this is going to be 3 halves plus 1, which is 5 halves. We sketch the range next to help us get the integral limits. So we have this blue line where y is equal to 3. We can't go past that. We have this purple line where y is equal to x. So we're going to stay to the right of that. And this other line where y is equal to x minus 2, we're going to stay to the left of that. That's the range. We're going to calculate the covariance now. So we remember that we had this covariance formula. And we're going to use the original formula in this case. You could have used the alternate formula. It doesn't really matter. So the original formula is x minus its mean times y minus its mean. And then we just work out the average with respect to the joint PMF or PDF. So in this case, what that looks like is just integrating from minus infinity to infinity this double integral, x minus 5 halves times y minus 3 halves, because those are the means, times the joint PDF dx dy. Okay, so that's what we need to do. We just need the integration limits. And we actually need f of x, y, because we need to take the product of this conditional PDF times the marginal PDF to get it. So the uh, marginal is just a third between 0 and 3, and 0 otherwise. And then the conditional PDF is one half between y and y plus 2 for x, so long as y is between 0 and 3, and 0 otherwise. Okay, so we just take the product of those. It's going to be 1 sixth. And as long as we're using the correct integration limits, it's fine to just plug in 1 sixth because it's just constant in the correct limits. Okay, so we're integrating on the left here from y to y plus 2 and then up down from 0 to 3. So if we plug that into a computer or work it out by hand, we would get 3 fourths. OK, and so let's just kind of draw this new shifted axis here. So what we're doing is centering it at um, x equals 5 halves and y equals 3 halves. So this is a new axis at, um, for the coordinate system x minus its mean and y minus its mean. And we'll notice that on average, x minus its mean and y minus its mean tend to have the same sign, OK? So they tend to spend more time in the plus plus and minus minus regions, which I've written in green. And you can imagine then that a line with a positive slope that crosses through this origin is going to do a better job of fitting um, the distribution than a line with negative slope. OK, so by linearity of expectation, we know that e of x plus y is e of x plus e of y. That's linearity of expectation. What about the variance of a sum? So this was the mean of a sum. What about the variance of a sum? It turns out that the variance of a sum is the variance of x plus the variance of y plus 2 times the covariance of x and y. This is an interesting formula, and intuitively the way you should think about it is that if x and y tend to have the same sign, then they tend to amplify each other when you add them up. So they tend to interfere constructively, and if they tend to have negative signs, then they would interfere destructively and reduce the variance. Okay. Why is this true? Well, if I write out the variance of x plus y, what that is is just x plus y minus the mean of x plus y, square the whole thing, take the average. I can work out, um, I can split these terms up into just x minus its mean and y minus its mean, whole thing squared, and then use linearity of expectation twice. So one thing I'm going to do here 
is going to notice that this first time I use linear of expectation to break up the expectation of the sum, and I'm opening up the terms in the square, and now I'm going to use it again here to write the first term as the variance, the second term as two times the covariance, and the third term as the variance. So that's why it's true. And a lot of these ideas and formulas just all come from the linearity of expectation. If we spend a little bit more time, we could show why the following two formulas are true. So the variance of a general linear function, ax plus by plus c, that would be a squared times the variance of x plus b squared times the variance of y plus 2ab times the covariance of xy. And the covariance of linear functions, so if I take two linear functions, so let's say that I call them um, u, which is ax plus by plus c, and v, which is dx plus ey plus f, then the covariance of uv we can get by just ad times the variance of x plus be times the variance of y plus ae plus bd times the covariance of xy. Okay, so these are really useful formulas to shortcut through some calculations. It's good to refer back to these later. Okay, some other properties, simpler properties you might find useful. So um, from the definition, we know that the covariance is symmetric. So covariance of xy is same as covariance of yx. Covariance of xx, if you look, it's just the variance of x. And the covariance of x versus a constant that's not random is just zero. We'll say that x and y are uncorrelated if the covariance is zero. Independence always implies uncorrelatedness. So if some two random variables are independent, they're uncorrelated. But if they're uncorrelated, they may not be independent. They could be, but not necessarily. If x and y are uncorrelated, then we get some simpler formulas. So when they're uncorrelated, the variance of the sum is just the sum of the variances. The variance of a linear function is just the appropriate weighted sum of the variances. So there are no covariance terms. And the same with the covariance of linear functions. If I try to work out the covariance of linear functions, I just get two appropriate sums of variances because the covariance term is zero. And finally, the expectation of the product is just the product of the expectations. And you can see this from the definition of the alternate covariance formula, just setting the covariance to zero there. Okay, the last thing we should talk about is that visualizing joint PDFs can be really useful, especially with contour plots. So let's say we're going to use color to help us denote the height of a joint PDF. So we can do this in a few ways. One thing we can do is draw a surface plot. So here's a surface plot where I have this 3D representation of the joint PDF, and I'm also indicating the heights of this surface with color. So yellow here is the highest and dark blue is the lowest. So I could take a top-down view and use these colors to represent heights. And so I'm going to do this by putting this contour plot directly underneath the surface plot. So you can see what it means. So basically exactly where the surface is the highest, I have this yellow circle region underneath and then I have these rings expanding outwards where I see um, different regions of lower heights until I get to the dark blue. And finally, I could just look at this contour plot only, and that is often easier to interpret. So let's do that here. So I have this contour plot only, so I take this thing that I kind of had at the bottom in the middle picture, and I'm just looking at it now top down, and I can see that I have a joint PDF that's centered at zero, zero. It's symmetric about both axes, um, and it's kind of contained in this region between minus three and three, that's where most of the energy is. And um, that's something that might be harder to read from this 3D plot. Of course, I can move the 3D plot around and kind of get the same idea, but I can get that much quicker by looking at the contour. So finally, let's look at some examples of contour plots just to give a sense for what you might see with different covariances. So here I've written out three different covariance plots and another three that also have the same covariances. So on this left column, I have covariance of negative one. And you can see that in both of these cases, in the top and the bottom, I tend to spend more times in the minus plus and plus minus quadrants, so um, where the signs are different. And that means a line of negative slope would fit pretty well. And you can see that if a line of negative slope, really y equals minus x, pass through these two distributions, it would do a pretty good job of explaining what's going on. 
But these are very different distributions. So one is just a single hill, and the other one is two, um, two symmetric hills. So visualizing it, I can see that, but if I just looked at the covariance, I wouldn't be able to tell these apart just from that one number. Same thing in the middle column, I have a covariance of zero, and I have the same picture I had on the previous slide, and then I have another picture with four clusters where it's clear that no line would do better job, would do a better job of explaining what's going on than any other line, and so we end up just having the covariance of zero. And then finally, for covariance of plus one, it's kind of like the left column, but tilted in the other direction. And I can see that a positive line, in this case, y equals x, would do a good job of explaining what's going on here. But the visualization is what lets me distinguish that there's one cluster versus two clusters. And that can help me in coming up with better methods for downstream applications. So overall, visualizations are really important. We don't want to forget about uh, doing this. And we always want to try to find a way, even in a very high dimensional data set, this was just two-dimensional, but in a high-dimensional data set, we always want to find a way to do a visualization to help us get some intuition.